What we're about to cover now is getting, there's a lot more to it. So we need all the brain power with the power of the Holy Spirit to really guide us. So let's pray, shall we? Loving Heavenly Father, once again we are so grateful to be here. We want to be your student. We want the Holy Spirit to teach us. So please open our eyes and open our minds once again that we may feel the urgency at the same time we may feel the mercy and the grace of God that we do have time today. So guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, and we are reading from verse 14. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 14. The Bible says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. When you read your Bible, you can, be, you can be a little bit confused or overwhelmed because there are so many words in the Bible that, and they all seem to be very important, every word. And we are trying to be sincere, honest, truthful followers of Christ. So we want to give great value to every word. So because of this, sometimes we feel overwhelmed with so much information. So you have to know how to organize what you're reading. So there are many ways to organize what you're reading, but one of the the ways is when you're reading a text, try to keep your focus on the main action word. It's like, what is happening in this text? And many times, main action word gives you a direction. What is happening? Yeah, action word. What is happening? And the rest of them, rest of the words are supporting what is happening. For example, in verse 40, um, obviously we... Obviously, the king of the north is the main character, but what is he doing? He is coming against the king of the south, um, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into many countries. So the focus is, somehow, yes, he's fighting back, but now the, the focus is, he is entering into many countries. So verse 40, King of the North enters. Just, I know there are other little details, but don't worry about that right now. Just think, verse 40, King of the North enters into many countries. And then, verse 41, he shall enter also into the one glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even... Edom, Moab, the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, what do we see about the king of the north in verse 41? He shall also enter into where? Glorious land. Very interesting, very interesting. Look at the progression. 
un, uh, again, um, the main action word seems to be he is entering again. Are you with me? So verse 40, he enters. Yes? Verse 41, he enters. But what's the difference? The difference is, verse 40, he enters into many countries, but, but verse 41, he enters into glorious land. It is as though giving the glorious land a special attention. He enters into many countries, but also, well, it's like, he's able to enter into many countries, but, oh, but look, look at him. Now he's able to enter into glorious land. Enter, enter, and progression. Now, by the way, by the way, and I have to say this. Uh, many of you know I'm not a pastor. I'm basically the best description for me, really, really, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart. The best description is I'm a Bible student. And somehow... I'm able to share what, what I am learning from the Bible with other people, really. You may call me Bible teacher, but I'm still a Bible student. So dealing with math, um, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, there are some things that I have no idea. So I don't know everything. Amen. Okay? But I do see things that are pretty substantial and clear. That I can share with you. And I will show you the things that I don't understand. Okay? Fair enough? It's not like I'm going to give you a complete um, meal. I give you a little appetizer. You finish the meal on your own. Okay, I guess that means that's good, okay. <laughs> but this appetizer is an appetizer, okay? So it should, uh, I'm, 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 I, I'm pretty sure that it, will, it should guide you well, okay? So, look at this. What are we doing right now? We're just concentrating on action words, the main action words. Verse 40, enters. Verse 41, enters. Now, continuing. Verse 42. Let's go there. Verse 42, it says, he shall what? Stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. What is the main action word do you see there? Stretch forth. Enters. Enters. Stretch forth. Do you see a repetition and progression? Yeah? Okay. What is stronger? What sounds stronger? You enter into somewhere and you're stretching your hands. Or you don't care. Oh, <laughs> you don't care. What? What sounds stronger? Stretch forth his hand. Right? There's more, there's more aggressiveness. Enter is just simply enter, right? <laughs> Huh? Uh, maybe a big fight. He enters and then he stretches his hand. Continuing, continuing. Verse 43. Here we go. Verse 43. Another action we're looking for. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his step. What is the main action word do you see there? Have Power. So look at this. I love to repeat. If you, know, if you know anything about me, I love to repeat things. Because I want to reinforce it. Enter, enter, stretch forth his hand, and have power. Do you see progression? Yes? Do you see the progression? you got to see this. you got to see this. All right? So keep collecting these action, main action words. Okay? And then verse 40. 
Um, verse 44, but tidings are the, out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and early to make away many. What is the main, what is the main action word for the king of the north? What's happening to him? There's an action and reaction. Something troubled him, yes? His reaction is fury, right? So something troubled him, and he got angry, fury. And he was going to destroy. So I will choose the, the last one, destroy. Okay? The other ones are kind of supporting it. So he enters, enters, stretched forth his hand, had power, but then something is troubling him. His reaction? Destroy. So the word destroy sounds stronger than before. Are you with me? Yeah? Okay. And then with this progression, what do we have? The very final thing in verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. What is his action word now? Huh? Plant. When you hear that word plant, does that sound destructive? What does that sound like to you? It's like establishing, right? Building. So, but based upon previous verses, the tendency, the, the, the natural trend is like, okay, how do you feel so far? Enter, enter, stretch forth, have power, destroy, plant. How do you feel? What's going on here, huh? Successful, okay. In what way successful? He's taking over. Exactly. You got to get this big picture. You have to get this big picture. Enter, enter, stretch forth, have power, destroy, plant. He is trying to take over. And what is he trying to take over? What is his main goal? Goal. His main goal is enter many countries? No. His main goal is enter into, glor uh, enter into glorious land? How would you define, hmm, that is his main goal? Yes, I can't, yes. You, in the big picture, in a big, uh, it, in a bigger sense, yes, it is his goal to enter into many countries, enter into glorious land, stretch forth his hand, have power, and to destroy. But really, ultimately speaking, his main goal is plant the tabernacle of his palace in between the scenes in the glorious holy mountain. But for him to get there, Guess what he needs to do? Enter into many countries, enter into glorious land, stretch forth his hand, have power, destroy. And in order to destroy, it's like part of that is to establish the tabernacle of his palace. Are you following? Why am I trying to give you this big picture? Here's the reason why. Many times when people study these verses, they are just focusing on one text, not seeing the whole picture. And you can easily get sidetracked. So what is the big picture? The big picture is the king of the north, what is he trying to do? He's trying to establish the tabernacle of his palace. Where? Between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. And the question is, why? And what is that? How is he going to do that? OK. 
Okay, let's try this. Let's try. Hmm, my recognition. Anyhow, you say, what is that? Um, that's Mediterranean Sea. And Jerusalem is right here, somewhere there. And Egypt is down here. Are you with me? Okay. And Jordan, you know, and then Lebanon up north. Yeah? Can you see it? Yeah, it's not bad, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not sure the starting point. I'm not sure the starting point, but somehow this king of the south pushed at him. Pushed the king of the north where? I'm not sure. And the king of the north came after him. Uh, which location? I don't know. But there's one thing that I do know. King of the North enter into many countries. That means, you know, all these countries. I'm just assuming. But one thing is clear. He enter into glorious land, which is Palestine. So basically, right there. Right? Now, before I cause any more, conf uh, before I cause a confusion, listen. I'm taking uh, verse 40 to 45 as literally as possible. However, I am not saying these things are going to be fulfilled literally. There's one principle that we just don't have time, I don't have time to explain, but for some reason, Towards the end of Daniel chapter 11, you can take things symbolically. And you should. How to make that transition, going from literal to symbolic? We have to go into a lot more observation, a lot more study on the details. But for some reason, when it goes from pagan Rome to paper Rome, Pagan Rome can be put in literal, but when you go to paper Rome, things are now changing to more spiritual. That's one explanation. But anyhow, you may want to study a lot more into that. But that's one of the major reasons why, I believe. So, however, I'm taking these verses literally as possible. Why? Because I need to understand them literally first, before I can start making spiritual applications. So literally speaking, what's happening here? King of the North, the Bible says, he enters into many countries. What countries? I don't know. Many. You know, these countries are around. But one thing is for sure, he enters into glorious land. Are you with me? And that's Palestine. For sure. No doubt about it. And then the Bible says, he stretches his, stretch his hand Towards where? Upon the countries. Okay. Stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not. So he is, now he is, not only he enters, but his hands are going to the countries, and also where? Egypt. So he enters into glorious, holy, uh, glorious land, and he is stretching his hand towards Egypt. By the way, in the olden days, what does it mean when a king enters into a new territory? What does that mean? He just came for a visit? What does that mean? What's the, what is the uh, connotation? Because rest of Daniel 11, if you read the whole chapter, is all about attack, defeat, victory, conquer, attack, war, fight, victory, conquer. We're seeing, basically, 
If I can give a title for Daniel 11, it's the history of world war. The wars of the great empire. Okay? So, chapter 11 has many war languages. So, within that contextual setting, when a king enters into a country, he is there to conquer it. You with me? He is there to conquer it. And he enters into glorious land because he wants to conquer it. He is stretching his hand over Egypt. What is he trying to say? He is trying to take over. Are you with me? Continuing. And then the Bible says in verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, of silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. And Libya and, and Ethiopia is next to Egypt. So really, he's coming down to take over, he's stretching his hand to take over Egypt and the surrounding countries. Then something is very, very interesting. So one thing is very clear. The king of the north, he is trying to take over everything. Can you see that? But then something is very interesting. Look at this. But the tiding out of the east, out of the north, shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. When a king destroys many or many people, the reason why he is doing that is because these many people are what? Rebelling, threat, not with him. Are you with me? Okay? So, based upon the tiding from the east and the west and the way he reacted, this tiding comes from comes from a place or from people that clearly announcing that they are not with him. Are you with me? Yeah. And at the same time, this tiding is troubling him. If it's troubling him, that means he feels threatened. And his reaction is to fight back. And so he now goes into his, his final um, effort, his final agenda, so to speak. Verse 45, he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. There we have to pay a super close attention. Plant. The, his tabernacle of, tabernacle of his palace between what? Seas in the glorious holy mountain. Some people, some people think between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, they're imagining, oh, that's between Mediterranean Sea and Dead Sea, we have Jerusalem. So between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Now that's a good explanation, I think. Or some people think, no, 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 no. It's between the seas and glorious holy mountain. So really, where's the location to plant his tabernacle of his palace. Is it in Jerusalem, between the seas, or is it between Jerusalem and the seas, meaning somewhere here? And guess what? It doesn't matter. Why? It does not matter why. 
Because if he's planting his tabernacle of his palace in Jerusalem, what is he trying to do? What is he trying to do? He's trying to conquer Jerusalem. Yes or no? Now, by the way, why do I say Jerusalem? Where is glorious holy mountain? Is Mount Zion. What is sitting on Mount Zion? Jerusalem, exactly. That's right. So if he is, so it doesn't matter if he is planting his tabernacle of his palace in Jerusalem. Basically, he is, it is saying he is trying to attack Jerusalem. And if you say he is planting his, this is so long, you know. He's planting his tabernacle of his palace between Jerusalem and the seas. So somewhere in between. And why would you plant there? Because you are trying to besiege the city in order to attack. So either way, the conclusion is the same. What conclusion? He is attacking glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem, to take over. Either way. So what's happening here? His, he entered into many countries. Then he entered into glorious land. He stretched his hand over. That's a hand. Uh, I, I can draw better than that, but uh, somehow it came out like that. Anyhow, he stretches hand. Is that better? Over many countries, and he is also stretching his hand over to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, did I say Jerusalem? That's from jet lag. Sorry. Uh, Egypt, but then he's, in other words. It looks like he's taking care of all these places first before he makes his final attempt to really attack Jerusalem. And then at last, he comes back, or he's already there. He's now making his final attempt to take over Jerusalem. Now, this is very interesting. Why Jerusalem? What does the Bible say about Mount Zion or glorious holy mountain? Obviously, if you do a study on Mount Zion or Glorious Holy Mountain, you are going to have scores of Bible texts. But here's one that I want you to consider. That's in Psalms. Let's go there. Psalms 48. Psalms 48. Here we go. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Verse 1. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. That's glorious holy mountain. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount. Zion, notice this, check this out, on the sides of the north, the city of great king. Who is the king? Here, who is the king here? God, right? And his city is on Mount Zion. 
following. The king is the god, right? His city is on Mount Zion, on the side of the north. So could we call him king of the north? Yes or no? Yeah? On the side of the north. Okay, let me confirm this. Do you remember Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14? Go there with me. Do you remember how uh, Lucifer wanted to become like God? Okay? So go with me to Isaiah um, 14. Isaiah 14, and verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, listen, I will ascend into heaven. So basically he wanted to be like God, right? Look at this. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of congregation in the size of the, where? North. Why north? The question is why north? What's wrong with the south, Lucifer? You don't like the south side? What about the west or the east? Why do you want the north side? Why do you want that place so much? Why? That's where God, in, in symbolically speaking, that's where God dwells. See, the north is actually describing God. For example, in the, a long time ago, sanctuary, they have four sides. And on the side of the north, that's where they had the... the like a flag pole was a picture of an eagle representing divinity, God. And the table of showbread, which represents the presence of God on the side of the north. So we have a number of places in the Bible indicating north is really, symbolically speaking, the side of God. Because north is, this is my thinking, this is my thinking, because north is always up. That's why. So, so, Satan, he wants to sit where? In the side of the north. Why is it? Happens to be the great king, his city is where? On Mount Zion, on the side of the north. So really, in a sense, who is, so to speak, truly the king of the north? is God. That's, may I say, that's one of his titles. But who wants to become king of the north? Satan. To take over. But then, here we have, um, here we have papacy described as king of the north. And what do we know about the little one power? He makes himself as God. Very... Just, like, just the same as what Lucifer wanted to do. You see, that's what Lucifer wanted to do. He wants to be God. He wants to be the king. He wants to have the side of the north. Little one power. He wants to be God. His blasphemy is against God. And what does he want to do? Or, interesting enough, he is also considered to be the king of the north. Very similar characteristics. But, it seems to be you are not the king of the north unless you possess the glorious holy mountain, the city that is situated on the side of the north of Mount Zion. So it's like the last attempt. And there's another aspect that maybe we cannot really prove it from the Bible. Maybe we can. Because we do have verses in Isaiah, some other places in the book of Psalms. It gives you this idea. Listen, don't be offended. If your city is not the center of the world, don't you know Jerusalem is considered the center of the world?
the idea is, if you conquer Jerusalem, you conquer the whole world. And, and Bible also gives a very similar idea, because Psalm says, Mount Zion, the joy of the whole earth. That's where God dwells, where the rest of the world is supposed to come and worship Him. That was the original plan, so to speak. So, King of the North taking over, King of the North taking over the, the glorious holy mountain, he's trying to be, he's trying to set, set himself up to be the center of the whole world, the main leader of the whole world. Are you listening? It's that idea. And we can see his attempt, his war strategy. And look at this. In Daniel, go back to Daniel. Now we have to like tiptoe our way because now every detail becomes intricate and, and delicate and pretty profound and powerful. So here we go, Daniel chapter 11. He shall plant the what? Tabernacle of his palace. Plant meaning established. But listen, listen, listen. The word tabernacle, in the original language, it means dwelling place. But in the Old Testament, often the word tabernacle is used as what? Another word for tabernacle. Come on. Sanctuary. Exactly. So question to you. Who usually dwells in tabernacle? God or? High priest. Exactly. But palace, who usually dwells in palace? King. Interesting, isn't it? Tabernacle is more, you know, high priest, religious. And palace, king, more political. He shall plant, he shall establish tabernacle, religious, of his palace, political. Perhaps this is giving us the idea of he shall establish or somehow he will help to establish the union of church and state. Exactly. For what? Ready to attack. But let's, let's look at this with microscope. Check this out. In the language, if you are about to attack, what was your usual tactical method of attacking, attacking a city back in those days. Besieged, exactly. So they're besieging the city, okay? So here is here's Jerusalem, and they're besieging the city. What is, a, what is the, the purpose behind that? Besiegement. Starve them to death, exactly. Cutting off their life support, okay? But, question to you. But before there was a besiegement, how did the cities back in those days survive? Um, do they have all the water and garden all there? How do they get their supplies? By? Yeah, by business, merchants, right? Coming into the city, yes or no? So look at this. When you cut off that, there's no more what? Business coming in, therefore there's no more buying and selling. Are you listening? Union of church and state, besiegement, and possibly controlling, so to speak, cut off people's life support by controlling their right to buy and sell. The last attempt. And when we see this attempt, 
Guess what's near? Probation is about to close. But now, let's go a little deeper. Let's backtrack. Let's backtrack. Look at this. Look at the previous text. Just before he plants, okay? Verse 44 is, what's happening in verse 44? A message is coming to him that troubling him, right? And by reacting to that message, he wants to go and destroy. And maybe that's the reason why he is now planting the tabernacle of his palace. But before this message is being, this message is coming. What's happening just before? In verse 43. But he shall have what? Power over the what? Treasures of gold and of silver. Over all the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Meaning they will support him. What's the language here? Gold and silver. Precious things. Treasures. What are we talking about? Commerce or finance. Look at this. He shall enter into many countries. Enter into many countries. Now he has power over many countries. He shall enter into glorious land. It's like coming closer to, so to speak, where God's people are. Are you with me? And then he stretched forth his hand over many countries and Egypt. And then now he has a power, not only enter and stretch forth his hand. The Bible says clearly he now has power over the treasures of gold and silver. What does that mean? He has regained his finance. After this, what do we see? Tidings from the north and the east is coming. And the king of the north reacting to that? He wants to make war. With, he's angry. He wants to destroy many. And then he, what does he do? Plant. Tabernacle of his palace, union of church and state. So what's going on here? You know what I expect? If, I, if, I, if, if my observation is correct, this, these verses are telling me when we see the union of church and state to attack, besiegement, this thing is somehow connected to the tidings coming from the east, coming from the north. But this message, it looks like it's given right after King of the North regains his financial power. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So, looking at that, it is very interesting to observe that it's like before he can make his final blow upon the glorious holy mountain, he has to have complete control of the countries and finance. Are we seeing something similar thing happening? Interesting, interesting. You know, do you remember uh, last year? How many of you remember um, when Michael Jackson died? No, you don't, you don't know? You know, you're just kind of embarrassed. I don't know Michael Jackson. <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> Look, he used to be my, you know, back in those days, doing my moonwalk, he was my idol. Not that I worship him, no, not, I mean, before, perhaps, maybe, but now, no. But, 
No. But, but, you know, it was kind of strange. It was kind of strange. When I heard that he died, it's like, he's my homeboy. It's like my, you know, my buddy. And he passed away. It's like, oh, man, my generation is dying off. It's like, that's so sad. Um, and it was a big news, big, big news. Like, who killed him? What? Maybe they drugged him. July, I still remember, Ju last year, July, the first Tuesday, they had the big funeral service at the stable um, center in LA. Have you, heard, have you heard about that? Yeah, if you, ask, if you ask people, they go, yeah, 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 we heard about that. We saw on CNN, Fox News, and you know, whatever. Uh, but if you, if you ask them, have you heard the, the announcement that Pope made? Huh? What announcement? What, what, what are you talking about? It, it's very interesting. On the very same day when Michael, when they had the funeral for Michael Jackson, when everybody's attention was on Michael's funeral, Pope makes an announcement. What announcement? He said, on that day, in order to fix this global financial crisis, we have to have global leader, global authority to fix this problem. I'm paraphrasing it, but basically that's exactly what he said. Something to think about. It, could that be one of those signs? Financial power means financial control, yes or no? If you know anything about human history, the natural response to chaos, you know what it is? Natural response to chaos is day one, order and control. Security, exactly. So if there is a great attempt to have great financial control, it's reacting to financial disaster, chaos. So is it possible that all this financial disasters and chaos and crisis is actually conditioning the people's mind for global financial control? If that were to happen, and if that comes under the papal power in some ways, could that be a fulfillment of what Daniel 11, verse 43 is talking about? And if that is true, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? What comes after that? Tidings from the north and tidings from the east. It's really hard to prove what that tiding is. But one thing is sure, King of the North does not like that tidings. So it's got to be something good. Amen. And tidings meaning good news. It comes from the North. Maybe, perhaps, comes from the true King of the North. It comes from the East. Hard to figure out what this East is. Only thing that we do know, Jesus coming back from the East. And also, in Revelation chapter 16, talks about Christ and his army as kings of the east. So maybe king of the north, God's message. King of the east, second coming message. I don't know. But one thing is for sure, this is God's message. So what is God's message in the last days? Three angels' message. So maybe if we put it together, as we see more of a financial control of the whole world, it's time to, really the time to give, three angels' message. And that is the reason why you are here today. For me to say this, it took me three hours. <laughs> why? Because... We have to, because we may only have a window of opportunity to give this message. And this message, if we give it with full power, it's going to cause the king of the north to get angry. 
and the reaction will be there. The union of church and state. And around the time, if we see the union of church and state, what does that mean? Probation is about to close. Soon, Michael shall stand up. We have all these prophetic reactions and actions all connected, and we are right, it looks like we are in the right, right in the middle of it. At the end of the day, it is up to you. If you want to believe it or not, you have the total freedom. But I do want to invite you to consider these prophetic messages at that time. The question is, are we living at that time, at least close to that time? When we see all these things are taking place in the world today. I know we have a, uh, interesting discussions about what is glorious land, what is glorious holy mountain, what's Edom, Moab. I don't have all the answers to these things. But when I look at the big picture, I definitely see the final attempt of the king of the north to take over the world. And in order, in order for him to do that, he needs to take over glorious holy mountain. And I personally believe that glorious holy mountain represents the remnant, the very elect. He needs to be able to control the very elect in order to control the whole world. Basically, that's what it is, the mark of the beast, to attack God's people. So, there you have it. Prophetic time chart. Seeing our present and future in the pages of prophetic language in the book of Daniel. I don't think we have completed our study. We have much more to learn since this is still in the future. I'm sure many things can be still incomplete until actual event is fulfilled. But until then, we continue to study, continue to watch, continue to pray, continue to observe. But if today's observation, even though it was limited, partial, but if today's observation is correct, my friends, sounds like we are living in a very exciting time. What do you think? Things can change very fast. So um, what's your retirement plan? <laughs> what are you planning to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? You want to uh, have a nice, you want to plant of your palace somewhere, you know, at a nice, oh, nice place somewhere in Australia where poisonous, poisonous snakes are? I don't know. Where, 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 what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Now, uh, now, look, please, don't misunderstand me. Nothing to be rich, make money, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having a nice place. No, no, no. Nothing wrong. Those are perhaps necessary, and sometimes we are a little more blessed, understandable. But the question is, where is your final destination? What is your focus? Is it just to maintain your life, just to survive? Or are you, are, are you making a difference in this world? Your everlasting plan. So I want to invite you to challenge yourselves, to come up, to be higher than who you are now. If you're just thinking, I just need to go to good college, get good grade, get a good job, and have a good, you know, good, just peaceful life, make steady income, pay my mortgage, pay my bills, internet, and, um, you know, have enough food in the refrigerator and eat, live, and just die someday. Oh, yeah, that sounds really happy. <laughs> wow, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, man. So my friends are from this country, from overseas. This world... I know, it's disappointing, but this world has to be a little more than 
just bread and water. So what is your, things will go bad. So what is your plan? I challenge you to challenge yourself. To think bigger, higher, and stronger, sharper. I, I know we have many mistakes, many faults, many things to you know, still fix, change, transform. I understand. But don't allow anything to discourage you. But make your decision. Learn to say these words. It's OK, I don't have anything. As long as I know the truth, and the truth alone, and the true reality of life, based upon Jesus, based upon eternal covenant, the promises of God. I want to live beyond this world. So what do you think? Is that what you want to do? If you do, I invite you. Get active, be practical, sign up for those things that can give you good practice in practical Christianity. So, would you like to stand with me as we have this humble prayer of a decision to challenge ourselves more than what we are thinking of ourselves. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Michael, the Bible says that Michael shall stand up. And a time of trouble will come. But your people shall be delivered, those whose names are written in the book of life. But before you stand up, oh God, the Bible makes it pretty interesting indication that there's going to be the final attempt of attacking God's people from the king of the north. We read about the tidings from the north and the east, and we see the financial control, the gaining of power and influence, and the growth of this king of the north worldwide. We do confess, oh God, that we don't understand everything. Perhaps there are, perhaps there are many things that we don't, we don't see. But Lord, one thing is clear. If this prophecy is true, we have nothing to look for in this world. We praise you, we thank you for being able to survive and have enough and have more than enough. We thank you for that. But we pray that our focus will not be there. We put our focus, that which is eternal, that which is real and true. The reality of life based upon who you are. So help us, oh God, to challenge ourselves. That we may see eternal things that can help us to forget about earthly things. May we continue to have love, faith, and hope, and the truth, righteousness, and the mercies of God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.